Welcome to Blue Collar and a Scholar, where your regular blue collar guy, yours truly, gets to ask world renowned scholars anything I want. <laughs> Today, I am really excited. I have to admit, I've never been more interested in asking a man any questions than this gentleman today. Today we have Dr. Richard Gallagher. Richard Gallagher, I'm going to read this because there's so much I want to uh, say about this gentleman. He's a graduate of Princeton University as well as Yale uh, Medical School, professor of psychiatry at New York Medical College, and a psychoanalyst at Columbia University. He's fluent in Latin and ancient Greek, uh, and is the longest serving member of the International Association of Exorcists. He loves animals, especially his two cats, I'm sure he'll tell us about today. Um, he actually played professional basketball in France. And from just talking with him, and I've talked to a lot of people, he's just a really nice guy. Honestly, very nice guy that wants to help people and has probably helped more people than anybody I've ever met. So before I get into any questions, I just wanna remind everybody here, the only thing I asked you to do is if you are buying or selling real estate, go to realestateforlife.org. This way you have a pro-life realtor company. You know your money's going to help the unborn. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Gallagher, thanks for coming on our show. And uh, I just got to ask you, why would a board certified Ivy League psychiatrist be involved in exorcisms? Well, I've seen a lot of exorcisms in, in my life. I, I always have to make sure that people understand, you know, I'm not a priest or an exorcist. So basically, I work with exorcists. I'm sort of a scientific advisor. I am I am the longest standing American member of the International Association of Exorcists, which is approved by the Vatican. So I've served on their governing board for a while. I'm the longest standing American member because all, all the older guys when I joined as a young man uh, have passed to their reward. <laughs> um, but how I got involved, Rob, is is uh, is is kind of an interesting question. I always mention to people, I never volunteered. <laughs> Believe it or not, everything I've done from seeing cases to writing a book, uh, which uh, I did about two years ago, Demonic Foes by HarperCollins. Yeah, highly recommend this book, honestly, Demonic Foes. Definitely get it available on Amazon. Thank you. Even Hollywood is knocking on my door, and I, I do a lot of I do a lot of lectures and that sort of thing. So everything I've done um, is because I've been asked to do it. I would like to believe that it's more providential that way. Amen. In fact, I'm not sure that it's really a terrific idea <laughs> to volunteer I to get into the field. <laughs> you know, uh, I I was asked. I was asked. It was interesting. There was a uh, after I finished my residency at Yale, um, I was working at Cornell Medical College. They have a beautiful campus right near where I live in uh, Westchester, New York. And uh, all of a sudden, this somewhat rumpled looking priest knocks on my door and introduced himself, pleasant, pleasant man. And he says, well, Dr. Gallagher, um, I have a case that um, I'd like you to evaluate. I think it has a demonic component to it. Turned out to be what we call an oppression. We can get into these distinctions if you want, uh, Rob. Absolutely. And I said, well, you know, Father, with all due respect, I guess I guess he knew I was a Catholic. Uh, with all due respect, I said, I'm a little skeptical of that stuff. As a matter of fact, during that time, uh, there was something called the satanic panic in America. Mm. That was where all these people were uh, claiming they were Satanists all over the place, that Satanists were kidnapping kids. Somebody, uh, estimated, that actually. somebody estimated that there were uh, in one year, actually, I remember reading this during my residency, in one year, 50,000 kids had been kidnapped by Satanists. 
Now that's more kids than disappeared that year. And <laughs> most, most of those kids were runaways. And there was also false memories. And, and again, when I was at Cornell, I studied true versus false memories. There, there were a number of false memories about Satanists. So uh, I'm certainly not skeptical of Satanists. I've met a few. <laughs> And, uh, uh, you know, I have very good evidence that some of them do exist. Having said that, one also has to be careful that one doesn't exaggerate this type of thing. Um, so having said that, he said to me, um, would you be willing to evaluate this case? And it was a case that had actually come all the way from the West Coast. And um, I said, well, look, Father, with all due respect, and of course, I was aware of the gospel stories and stuff. But I said, with with all with all due respect, I'm a little skeptical of some of this stuff. And I, I remember, I remember he kind of chuckled and he said, "Well, then, Doctor Gallagher, you're the perfect man for the job," <laughs> uh, because he wanted to. He wanted someone who you know just didn't automatically uh, feel that every mentally ill patient was psychotically disturbed or something. And then the rest is history. He he and a uh, colleague of his, uh, I call the colleague uh, Father A, in the book, uh, Rob, I use all pseudonyms and that sort of thing, but all facts are correct. Uh, I call the priest who came to my office, Father Jacques. That was actually not his real name, uh, but everything else about him is true. He worked with his colleague, uh, Father A, and that really was the the way the way that other priest who's who kept his name secret as well, uh, he he referred to himself, and then he 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 and he and his colleague Father A would um, travel all around because there weren't very many exorcists then. Again, it's it's not that what long. Was that? What year was that? That was around nineteen ninety. Okay. And um, surprisingly, in America, even after the commotion about the Exorcist movie, which was much earlier, which was 1973, I think, um, there really were very few exorcists in America. And so these guys would see cases all over the country. And I'd hear about them and sometimes travel with them to see cases. That's why I've wound up seeing even according to my former chairman uh, of psychiatry, who was a Catholic, a very prominent Catholic, who was a former president of the American Psychiatric Association. Um, he he wrote the preface to my book, and he said, I've, I've undoubtedly seen more of these cases than any physician in history, uh, which is also, uh, reflects the fact that I see people on Zoom and, and phone calls. In fact, you know, I'm, I hate to say this, but I just, I get so many requests, I can't answer them all. Yeah, I was surprised you called me as quick as you did. I appreciate that. That was, uh, so. Yeah, I, was, I wasn't talking so much about requests for interviews, but requests. Oh, to, to I mean, there's the that too. I mean, a good, a good Catholic guy like you, I wouldn't turn down. <laughs> I, I'm talking about victims from all over the world wow. trying to get a hold of me. And uh, unfortunately, you know, I just I can't answer them all, but I try to help out when I can. So how do you how do you rule out mental illness or a physical condition that might be making them act weird? Like how how would you say to the priest, there's nothing uh, that I could diagnose as a medical doctor? Is that is that how you do it? You just. You don't say, oh, I think this person's possessed. You just tell the priest, I'm ruling out anything medical. Is that how it works? Yeah, that's a, that's essentially my role. And, um, you know, sometimes it's very easy. You know, I tell people, look, uh, I tell some of my psychiatric colleagues, how many, how many, how many uh, patients have you had who levitate or who speak foreign languages all of a sudden? Uh, you know, sometimes it's obvious. And, I mean, and a very... A very good exorcist can can often tell, but there are tricky cases, and there are sometimes people with different um, conditions uh, who either imagine or are convinced based on their symptoms that they're possessed or something when they're not. Now that that includes 
psychiatric conditions, especially. Uh, could it could include other attacks, like in the past, even in the Gospels, you know, you see that some of these individuals had convulsions. Um, I don't think they were true cases of epilepsy. So you have to rule out even neurological disorders as well as um, psychiatric disorders. The most common psychiatric disorders tend to be people who dissociate what we used to call multiple personality, people who are psychotic and feel that they're hearing the voice of a devil or something when they're not, when it's when it's a brain disease, and or people who are very evil or have very strong personality disorders where they're dealing with very aggressive impulses. A lot of these people will, or their families will think they're possessed or something and they're not and those people need treatment um and all throughout history you know there have been different things that have been confused with possession including some people's overactive imagination having said that um the church uh, and i would say especially the church in america and the bishops who are ultimately responsible they're pretty good at pulling in a psychiatrist uh, to help the evaluation so have you actually seen people levitate? I have not, um, but I've talked to, in the course of my, you know, 25 plus years doing this, I've talked to uh, approximately 35 people who have either witnessed it and are, are very honest people and or have experienced it themselves. Wow. You know, for instance, one of the person in the book I talk about is a guy named, uh, um, I call him in the book Juan. He was a drug lord and a gangster who had turned to Satan. Uh, and um, he believes that Satan helped his gangster career until he didn't. And at which point he got imprisoned. And the ch prison chaplain um, felt he was possessed. And it was reported to me, including by his wife. Uh, I met one years later, and he was actually, by that point, he had become Catholic, and he was a lovely guy, but he was still possessed. Wow. So people don't always get immediately delivered. And his wife told me that not only did he speak Latin, which she recognized from her school years, but also uh, in, in, a, in a trance state, but also... Um, uh, levitated, levitated in their bedroom. So these these things happen. They're rare. Levitation is rare, which is why, despite the fact that I've evaluated a lot of people with possession, uh, I've never seen one myself. I do write in the book, though, about a very, a woman who's become sort of famous in the internet. Uh, I call her Julia. Again, that's a made up name, but everything in the chapter on her in the book is absolutely true that is a case that hollywood wants to make a movie out of which i wow. will probably do that will make a great movie i've told like five people that story already uh so if you want to share that story uh, uh she was the one that involved your cats i believe was yeah that's how that's the way i uh introduced her uh that's the way i got introduced to her i'll tell you that story in a second and it, it was a remarkable case, and you can even read it on the internet, the possession of Julia, um, because she's become a little notorious. So it was remarkable, Rob, that a couple of things came together. First of all, these two exorcists I mentioned, Father Jacques and Father A, they were very experienced, and they even they said to me, this was the most flamboyant case they ever saw. So it was a very dramatic uh, case and exorcism. Uh, they wanted me to evaluate her, not so much, which I did pro bono, not so much because they were confused that she was possessed. It was obvious that she was possessed for reasons I'll get into, but because she was very ambivalent about getting help. She knew she was a thoughtful person. She knew she was possessed. 
Um, but she was she was scared of the Satanist cult. And a third remarkable thing about her case is she was a devil worshiping Satanist. And so since she kind of had to talk to me, uh, she was required by the priest and because she legitimately wanted to get rid of the possession. And also, um, I think she was intrigued talking to a doctor, you know, and she seemed to, <clears throat> typical of uh, certain possessed cases, uh, especially in their trances, they um, often really disparage priests, but she treated me much better than she treated the priest. Yeah, I see some of the stuff you wrote was pretty brutal, what she said about the priest. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, now, she always said that she would be uh, truthful. Um, I did believe her, um, but she refused to leave the cult. And in part, she said she had been in love with the cult leader. Uh, she described herself as the queen, the high priestess. She was kind of um, enamored of this uh, leader of the cult who was truly a bad guy. Um, and in addition, I think she was afraid that if she left the cult, she'd be harmed. So eventually she gave up, she gave up her, her search for a possession and, you know, not every possession is, uh, is, uh, successful. Uh, you have to, you know, I always tell people what Hollywood gets wrong the most is it's not magic person has to work at it in addition to, you know, the prayers of the church being helpful. So she eventually dropped out. Now she had a series, she had several exorcisms, none of which unfortunately I could go to. Um, I can tell you about those in a minute. You asked about my introduction to her. My wife and I were in the, in our bedroom and we, we had two cats who would sleep at the foot of the bed. And all of a sudden, very late at night, uh, like 2 a.m., 3 a.m., these cats went berserk. And they were fairly well-behaved cats. So we were surprised. We thought, you know, was this catnip? Did they eat something bad? Who knows? We had to separate them, and I, I didn't give much more thought to it. So the next morning, literally, you know, just a few hours later, the next morning, uh, the doorbell rings and the priest, Father Jacques, to my annoyance, brings this woman to my house. I later said to him, Father, listen, you know, try not to bring a, a Satanist to my neighborhood. <laughs> the remarkable part of this story was and he apologized. What the remarkable part of the story was, I knew I was going to meet this woman, but I hadn't meet her, met her yet. I hadn't I never talked to her. And when I opened the door and the priest introduced her, again, I'll use the pseudonym Julia. Uh, Julia says to me, oh, nice to meet you, Dr. Gallagher. Oh, by the way, how did you like those cats last night? Wow. Did you uh, I, I would have got scared. Did you get scared? Or did you just get more annoyed? <laughs> but my again, I had had some experience by this point with other okay. cases. So I knew weird things could happen. Um, I was kind of annoyed. You know? <laughs> I, I was a little speechless too, which is rare for me. <laughs> and um, you know, I later told her, I said, "Don't ever do anything like that again. I'm not going to be involved." <laughs> and she kind of smirked. She really, she never really apologized. I mean, to what extent was she involved? I mean, obviously she couldn't cause that himself. She told me something very interesting, which is I always tell people who feel they have paranormal gifts. She said, no one is gifted. She said, I think some of, uh, some of you Catholic people have gifts from God, some of you Christians, but everybody else who's gifted uh, psychically is getting it from, from the dark side. Wow. So, she never thought she was gifted, even though she exhibited quite a few psychic abilities, even outside of her trance. It was a lot of time with a possession case, Rob. You'll see 
somebody say something that they couldn't possibly know. There's a Latin term for that, later. It's a sign of, you know, sometimes something demonic. And, um, but she could tell things even outside of the trances. For instance, she told me how my mother died years earlier of wow. ovarian cancer. And she did that about a lot of people. She even had what the parapsychologists struggle to understand. Uh, it's called remote viewing. I don't know if you ever heard that. It, it's like projection, it's, the same as projecting. Is that it's a little bit like astral projection, but it's basically okay. not that the person feels they're in a different place, but that they can see things at a distance. Wow. And she told me that a, a couple of times, and I was a little skeptical. And then. What happened is uh, we were talking about the exorcist, uh, this Father A, who was the chief exorcist. And she said, you know, I can see him right now. And, you know, it, it's it's all this kind of paranormal mumbo jumbo. I can see him in my third eye and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. All this occult stuff. So I wasn't gonna let her get away with it. And I said, I had, an, I had a comfortable enough relationship with her that I could say to her, well, listen, uh, Miss Smarty Pants, uh, <laughs> you tell me what he's doing, and then I'm going to call him. And she said, well, um, I think this is unusual for him, but he's walking along the beach saying his mumbo jumbo prayers. Wow. And I said, what is he wearing? She said he's wearing a blue windbreaker and he's wearing his khakis. This guy was a, I played basketball in France, semi-pro. I was kind of a big fish in a little pond, <laughs> but, and I'm six foot five. Wow. This guy, this guy was a couple of inches taller than me, a very tough ex-Marine. Oh, no way. Nice. And, um, uh, he was, in some ways, I think, the most experienced exorcist America has ever had. Is he still alive? No, he's he's no longer alive. Uh, God rest his soul, and uh, and he will be rewarded for his work, I'm sure. But um, so she said, he's also wearing his khaki pants from the military. So I said, okay, I'm going to call him. Now he was about a hundred miles away. Uh, Julia was with me in Westchester. And I said, um, you know, Father A, uh, how's it going? We had become friends by that point. So I said, oh, you know, I, I'm taking a walk along the beach. Um, I didn't stay in the rectory. I just I wanted to say my breviary, which is, wow. as you know, Rob, the daily prayers for the priest uh, along the beach. And I said, uh, and what are you wearing? And he said, um, who wants to know? <laughs> <laughs> I said, humor, humor me, Father. Let me know what you're wearing. He said, well, I have a windbreaker on. And I have, you know, I have my khakis. I said, what color is the windbreaker? And then it dawned on him. He said, I know what's going on, Rich. You're talking to Julia, right? She is something else, isn't she? Wow. So she had that ability. She had several other abilities. Um, he asked about if I got, you know, scared or creeped out. There was there was one incident I'll relate that literally, because it's the only time in my life, you've heard the expression, the hairs on the back of your neck go up. I felt that, and I was going to ask you about that. This is the only time in my life where that happened, because I had heard her in a possessed state because I saw her in some trance states as well. So I saw, you know, people come in and out of these possessive trances. So I'd seen her in that. So I knew kind of what the demon sounded like uh, or demons, you know, you never, it's hard to know sometimes. And the voice uses the person's vocal cords. In other words, it, it takes over, it controls the body. It doesn't sound like a ghost. I've been to many exorcisms. It doesn't sound like a ghost. It sounds like a different personality and a different tone of voice uh, is using the body 
just as they take over the consciousness of the individual. So it's not disembodied. So um, I was on the telephone. Uh, now I'm on a landline with uh, Father Jacques, the other exorcist involved, um, who I was I saw much more often and saw many more cases with him. And um, he was asking me if I could come to the exorcisms. Now, you know, I had a family. I had a, you know, pretty responsible job as a clinician and an academic psychiatrist. So I couldn't travel to the exorcism, um, which was not in my area. And at the time, I mean, Julia went home. So she was like a thousand miles away. And then she would come back to somewhere in the Northeast, which I never mentioned, uh, for the exorcisms. So while he and I, the priest and I, were talking on the phone, on the landline, all of a sudden, that demonic voice, now she wasn't in on the conversation. She was a thousand miles away. That demonic voice comes in over the phone line. Wow. And it says the same repetitive stuff, you know. I'm not going to try to imitate it, but it was something to the effect of, <clears throat> listen, you uh, effing, effing priest, um, uh, leave her alone. You're going to be sorry. Wow. She's ours. Leave her alone. And I remember what he called her, he, what he called the priest. He called him a monkey priest. Wow. Which is, Rob, I think how they regard human beings. Mm, like we're, we're just and they as fallen angels as i'm sure you you recognize they're very intelligent and they think we're very stupid and they and we think we're just evolved monkeys or something wow so uh which is one of the reasons they feel like they can practically attack us you know because they have a right to treat us almost like animals or pets Wow. Of course, of course, the other reason they attack us really is because they hate God. And so they they want to not only corrupt us, but um, Take sort us of out. intimidate us made in the image and likeness of God. Wow. So how many exorcisms have you like? I, I, I know you you've uh, examined a lot of patients, but have you actually been involved, you know, maybe like restraining? I know only a priest that's uh, given permission from the bishop can actually perform the exorcism. But I know he has, I had Father Vincent Lampard. He said there's usually like a team that he has. Yeah, I, know, I, know, I know Vincent is a uh, very articulate. Uh, he's, uh, he's amazing. He's amazing. Very articulate, experienced guy. So have you participated in several that where you were actually in the exorcism? Uh, yeah, occasionally, occasionally I've had to help out in restraining. I'm usually there as an observer. Okay. And, you know, a commentator. I mean, I, I, I keep quiet and I, I never, I try not to talk to demons, although a couple of times in the evaluations I've, I've had to do it wow. just to get, just to understand it. But I've been to, now some of these cases are repetitive cases. Okay. So uh, I've been to maybe 200 exorcisms. Wow. What would, what would you say was like the, I guess the word is uh preternatural, like a rare supernatural occurrence. What would be the most extreme thing you've ever seen? Well, I, th I think the thing that gives you a lot of pause is, again, I've never seen a levitation myself, despite these reports from other people. Uh, I have seen people with what I think is kind of enormous strength. They can they can try to free themselves for hours. Um in Julia's exorcisms, which I did not see, there were all these remarkable features. She spoke a number of languages. She, uh, the room went hot and then went cold. Uh, what I have, what I have seen quite a few times, is the demon speaking in a foreign language. And these people uh, do not know the language in their natural state, and and the uh, the person did not know the language. There was no uh, way they could uh, learn it. Absolutely, you know. I mean, these are people speaking fluent Latin wow. or sometimes sometimes I've heard ancient Greeks I've heard and you know Latin and Greek yourself so you Latin and Greek I know yeah oh, you recognize uh, sometimes the language I don't know uh, for instance uh you know they I think somebody was speaking in Chinese once wow. nobody nobody in the room spoke Chinese so we didn't <laughs> know. and interesting in her case her features 
she could contort her face that she looked a little Asian. It was kind wow, of that's remarkable. Interesting. But um, one of the more dramatic ones was when a, a woman spoke a foreign language, sounded vaguely Slavic or something, and nobody understood stood it. And this woman did not, you know, was not Slavic and she didn't know any other languages. And so we were all mystified until after the exorcism stopped. The priest said, oh, by the way, I was born in Bulgaria and she was talking to me in Bulgarian. Wow. That's hardcore. An another dramatic thing, again, which I didn't witness directly, but, you know, I talked to so many people. I, I hear about these things and I usually uh, want somebody to, to verify it, you know, a spouse or a family member or maybe a clergy that had seen it. Um, I write about a case I call in the book, again, a pseudonym, Barbara. Now, she was originally started uh, an exorcism. She was possessed. Um, and she started an exorcism with a Lutheran deacon. She was brought up Lutheran. And um, this deacon, um, excuse me for saying, was pretty inexperienced. I would imagine. Uh, so he was in a church hall, but they weren't they weren't taking appropriate precautions like holding her down. And once she went into the trance state, this woman who was 90 pounds soaking wet rushed at the deacon, grabbed him. He was like a 200 pound guy, threw him all across the room. Wow. That was that was the end of the uh, exorcism. <laughs> That's when you're um, a Catholic priest. <laughs> so there are these cases where uh, you see the classic signs of possession, which uh, again I, I I've I've seen them all uh, many many times. Speaking a foreign language, uh, knowing this hidden knowledge, and um, what about knowing like hidden sins? Like, wouldn't you be nervous if? Like you had a sin you didn't want anybody to know and you went in there, could they expose you? There, there are reports of that too, although I believe it or not, I've never seen it. I think it's I think it's more rare than people think. Okay. Um I, you know, it's it's one of the reasons, you know, yeah, the priest try try to choose the right people to help out. <laughs> Make sure you go to confession that morning. Exactly. So, uh, so these possessions, they're normally demons. It's not Satan himself. He's busy probably with big, bigger shots. Am I, you know, he leaves us regular people for his uh, legion of demons? Well, I, I am a little skeptical when they name themselves. Uh, first of all, they, they lie a lot. Okay. And uh, even though they have to tell the truth by the command of the exorcist on certain things, they don't have to tell the truth on everything. So... Interestingly, they will often start out by saying, uh, I'm Judas Iscariot, or uh, I've had people who are possessed, believe it or not, who've said, I'm Zeus. Wow. Uh, I had a guy who was possessed say, do you want to speak to Zeus? Uh, I said, not particularly. <laughs> uh, so they will often lie. They'll pretend to be something else. Now, eventually... And it's a good sign, mostly because it means that the demon is now having to submit to the authority of our Lord when they have to tell the truth about their name. And they, they will often give the name of a demon. Occasionally, they'll give the name of Beelzebub or say they're Satan. A lot of exorcists feel that what that means is they're really operating under the authority of mm. Satan. Uh, so it's a little it's a little um, murky sometimes, but they are forced eventually to admit that they are a demon. So the priests can force them to tell you the truth, tell them the truth. Yes, eventually. Now, remember, now, sometimes, sometimes it takes a while. Is it true what we see in these movies where like if you were to sprinkle holy water on them, they would react versus oh, that, that, you... that, that, that routinely happens. So. Yeah. Is it true the the priest 
may uh, test them and throw regular tap water on and then holy water to see is it i've heard well, they could do that. that they could do that they don't tend to do that uh although uh uh occasionally you know they will test the person in some ways you know yeah uh, so like blessed objects there would be blessed objects stuff like that i mean i can you know i as a layman can use that myself i i remember it was actually the guy who was possessed. He was in my office and I was I was evaluating him, which is why, you know, he said to me, do you want to talk to Zeus? Uh, but I, I became convinced that he was possessed. And I had a blessed metal. And I put it on him. I said, do you mind if I do this? And before I could do it, he grabbed the metal, threw it across the room. Wow. And so I said to him, thinking I was probably speaking to a demon or him in a very demonically influenced state. I said, you didn't like that, huh? And he said, uh, no, no, it was fine. <laughs> Which again, indicates how they just inveterately lie. Wow. You know, they lie, they confuse. I mean, in addition, they, uh, Rob, they're trying to, they're trying to play with us. You know, they, 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 they disrespect human beings. They want to corrupt human beings. Um, the one thing I tell people is never get involved in anything occult or dark. Yeah, I noticed you said in your book, uh, I think it was Juan, when he was an, uh, a gang member, uh, they would pray to demons. Uh, and then if there was a rat in the gang, they would go to the Ouija board and ask uh, demons through the Ouija board who the rat was. So I would imagine Ouija boards are not a good thing for anybody to use. Well, let me just say first, that, you know, there were a couple of cases. So let me just clarify the details, Rob. Uh, I'm sure it's hard to sort out. Juan himself was involved in the cult Santa Muerte, which is a Hispanic kind of death devil cult. And he felt it was very eff efficacious. It made him the kind of gangster he wanted to be. You know, he said, he said, Dr. Gallagher, I had all the women, all the Cadillacs I wanted. Wow. I think what you're referring to is the report, which is actually reported in a New York uh, newspaper of an MS-13 guy. Yeah, you're right. Yes, he called himself right. Speedy and he, that's right. yep. he eventually turned on MS-13, which again is not an easy thing to do. You get involved in these cults and these gangs. It's like the mafia. <laughs> they don't really want you to go. They right. feel they have a hold on you, which are very much like demons. Once demons feel you've turned to them, they don't want to let you go. But uh, what you're referring to is not so much a Ouija board as they would get in, the MS-13 guys would get into a circle and they would ask a, a, an evil spirit, a, a spirit, put it that way, in their, in their lingo, to come into one of the guys and one of the guys then would usually kind of convulse and go into a trance. And then they'd ask questions and the, the demon would give them the name, say, of somebody who was a rat. Now you got to remember, they lie. I was so, just going to say, you just told me they lie all the time. So they were, they must've had fun with those guys, the demons. Absolutely. And it was a kind of sport. And um, yeah, sometimes they would name someone. It's it's sort of like going to a psychic. Wow. You know, psychics are a little involved without knowing it um, in something a little shady. And so they can tell you information as with this MS-13 practice. Sometimes the information you get is correct which is why they pull people into that. You know, well, your uncle Harry says, hello, he he remembers the walks you used to take to the park. But other things will be, which is a way of pulling people in. On the other hand, they often tell lies. For instance, I had a woman once who claimed that this psychic knew all about her past life and she came to me and she said, 
I said, so why are you coming to me? She said, well, I'm devastated by what the psychic said. This was actually a woman doctor. Wow. And she said, so, we, you know, even very smart people can turn to psychics and fortune tellers and healers and all these occult people. And she said to me, um, well, the psychic told me I will never get married. You know, she was a young woman. She she was single. She wanted to be married. Uh, I said, you don't have to believe that. That's probably a lie. Because contrary to what is an impression, both fortune tellers and demons, who often are behind occult activity, they do not know the future. Even angels don't know the future. Mm. Only God, only God knows the future. That's interesting. So when when a when a fortune teller or a demon in a, in, an, in an exorcism or so makes says something is going to happen in the future, they don't, they don't know that that's true. They're, they're guessing. Now sometimes they're very good guessers because they they're very small, guessed, or they may even they may even know things that we don't know. Okay. Uh, you know, they may know that. Somebody went to a doctor and the doctor said, you know, this to his colleague, this guy's probably going to have a heart attack soon. They know that because okay. they, they observe things. So they'll know it before the victim themselves. So they'll say, you're going to have a heart attack. The guy has a heart attack. Everybody goes, oh, my God, that fortune teller was right. But even the demon didn't know the future. He's good at predicting the future, which, of course, is another reason, in addition to his lies, that sometimes he's wrong. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. Now, you had mentioned earlier there's a difference between possession and oppression. And now I read the scriptures and I see St. Paul said that there was a spirit that buffeted him. Uh, I'm guessing it was a demon. And he asked God three times to take the demon away. And three times God said, my grace is sufficient for you. And they even actually uh, said it was a gift, basically, because it kept him from becoming conceited. The great apostle, it, you know, God didn't want him to become full of himself. So in our life, I, I kind of observe something and I want to get your professional opinion. If your body and you're and you're the perfect guy, I said, man, this is the perfect guy to ask this question. I've always thought about because you're a medical doctor, a psychiatrist, and you know a lot about spiritual things. So if you're physically weak, it could affect your mind mentally. Like certain hormones aren't reaching your brain, maybe thyroid or whatever. Your brain isn't working optimal if your body's not working optimal does that make you more uh easily a target for satan because the bible says satan is like a roaring lion going around the earth seeing who he may devour and if you watch these wilderness shows the lions always go after the weak wilderbeast they don't go after the strong so this do the demons look for people that are maybe weak-minded you know maybe have some mental illness to attack or is is that something totally they don't care about. They're just going to attack you no matter what. Well, <clears throat> like a lot of good questions, and it is a good question. It has a complicated answer. Okay. You mentioned the word oppression. Uh, so let me backtrack a little bit about terminology real quick. Okay. Possession is when an evil spirit takes over the consciousness and the body, not the soul, it cannot affect the soul, okay. the body of the individual. Okay. They're in control of it, at least temporarily, sometimes for prolonged periods, but it's usually, it's usually, it almost seems like they come and go. They don't go, but they can surface. They, they can surface and submerge themselves. That's a possession. A lot of people around the world, interestingly, not so much the Italians, where I go every couple of years and 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 uh, to the to the meetings, but a lot of people around the world feel that all overt attacks that are not full possessions are called oppressions. Okay, I think you read the book, Rob. You you understand? I I use the term internal versus external right. oppression. Right. Even that is somewhat artificial. Okay. Uh, and it often is combined, but an external oppression would be somebody getting beaten up, 
which is like that first case that I evaluated for Father Jacques. Um, now, people can also be scra uh, scratched, choked. This stuff is not that common, but I've seen hundreds of these people. Wow. Again, because I've seen them all over the world. They actually have bruises on them. They say, Dr. Gallagher, I'm getting beaten up. Dr. Gallagher, I'm getting all these pains. Now you have to make sure that's not a medical problem. But Dr. Gallagher, uh, I feel I was choked. I feel I was pushed. That's an external oppression. Now, some people use a separate term when it when it's for a holy person. Um, you know, Father Amorth used to use the term attack on the holy. And he, he thought that was sort of different than what I'm calling an external oppression. But the terminology is less important. The fact of the matter is that demons can attack holy people, which they sometimes do, like the great saints, precisely because they hate holy people. And they hate someone who's bringing people to Christ. St. Paul seems to have been in that category. Okay. And he was attacked because he was such a great holy man. Um, most people who get attacked, admittedly, and, uh, you know, I'm not blaming anybody. Uh, you and I as Catholics don't judge people. But, you know, most people who get these oppressions, which may be internal, too. I'll give you an example. Well, that, that. that's, that's more of what I was thinking. Yeah. Um, what I call the external oppressions usually happen, and the in internal oppressions usually happen to people who have opened a door in some way. You know, maybe they did fool around with something occult or they they over relied on psychics or something like that. Or maybe they turned to something genuinely so very simple or evil in their life. Those so, people make them, those people make themselves vulnerable. It's not gonna happen to the average, you know, good Christian person. It's just it's not gonna happen. Uh, so it's not like I don't want your audience, you know, worrying about tonight. They're gonna look up, you know, the the and, every wall. Uh, yeah. yeah, you know, you just protect yourself uh, using Saint Paul's language with the armor of Christ. Amen. Uh, but Saint Paul was 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 in that category, and he was such an effective, um, you know, apostle to the Gentiles. Yeah. Now, an effective missionary that he that he, like some other people in history, have been attacked because they are so holy in doing God's work. Now, changing gears to a very unholy person, getting back to Julia, I'm going to ask you something that I'm going to warn my uh, viewers. It was very disturbing to me, and, I, and you even said you were repulsed when she told you this story. But I wanted to ask you about it. You had said she had mentioned to you that she was a breeder, she would get pregnant and then have an abortionist come in, abort the baby, and use the dead baby for a sacrilegious cell, black masses and stuff like that. Very disturbing. Everybody I tell, I see the look on their face. That's why I want to warn people. But to me, it seems, when well, you were talking earlier about the hair on the back of your neck, years ago, I was a young evangelical Christian, and I went to a, an abortion mill. I think it was a Planned Parenthood in Virginia Beach. And uh, I didn't know, no, unbeknownst to me, they were all Catholics. I, I thought I was praying with evangelicals, but it turned out they were all Catholics. And one of the Catholic guys asked me to go in the back and help them talk to the girls walking in and try and tell them God loves you and, you know, minister to them, tell them there's another way other than killing your baby. But as soon as we got back there, I felt the hair on my arms and the back of my neck go up. And I felt fear. Like I just was like gripped. And I looked at him and he goes, you feel that? I go, yeah. He said, his take on it was, these are the demons back here. And he said they're feeding on the blood of the unborn. Do you think what I felt was something supernatural, number one? Or was it just I was I was scared to begin with? And then my natural, I was scared going back there. And number two, if you see throughout history, and especially in the Bible, the pagans always would sacrifice babies. Is there, babies. Is there a connection between abortion and Satan? Do you, is, is there a connection or am I pulling two different things together here. 
Rob, another tough question, which sometimes doesn't have a definitive answer. Okay. Um, yes, I tell the story about Julia and uh, being a breeder, and that was in part why she thought she had this exalted status in the cult, and in part also why she thought Satan gave her so many favors. I mean, tragically, she said to me, I've done a lot for Satan. He, um, you know, he gives me favors. You know, she was proud of her psychic abilities. And, you know, what is, what is, what has your God ever done for me? Well, wow. obviously, obviously she was confused. Very confused. Now you're also, now again, remember we were talking about a panic about this stuff too. Even C.S. Lewis used to say, don't get over preoccupied that everything is caused by the devil. You know, human beings have a great ability on their own just to mess up things. Exactly. And, um, you know, you shouldn't deny the re reality of the of the devil and the evil spirits, but you shouldn't exaggerate it either. Okay. So in that particular case, I don't know. I do know throughout history that as you as you rightly note, uh, the Bible talks about these civilizations, these societies that often um, the ancient uh, Israelites wa uh, warred against. Uh, another example would be the Aztecs. Another example would be the Carthaginians. If you remember your Roman history in high school, maybe they all did child sacrifices. So there is something grisly you and I would agree about abortion. Um, it's just hard to know. I mean, sometimes these are desperate people. How much of that is their desperation and their ignorance? How much of that is demonic? I don't know, but you have to be careful also not to get carried away. Like, you know, there are all these demons or Satanists wreaking havoc with our country or something. Okay. I mean, there, there are enough, there are enough evil spirits around to just, you know, um, pray about and and try to become a good Christian about without, without exaggerating that they're all over the place. In that particular example, I don't know. Maybe maybe there was something there. I don't know. Yeah. So, before I wrap this up, there's. I, I try. What I'm trying to say, Rob, is you know. I try to be careful about what we can say and what we can't say. You know, we can speculate about things like that, but you know, we don't always know. You're a man uh, of science. You want to, you're going to well, state evidence. You're not going to. And even the church, you know, we talk about science. I mean, I regard what I'm doing as very scientific. In, in medicine, you diagnose people uh, with what we call a syndrome. It's, it's a, a mix of features that the best explanation for uh, an illness. It's the same with an exorcist. They're, they're looking at the whole picture. You always have to take the totality. You can never single out one thing and say that person is possessed. You have to look at the totality, even the history of why this happened in the first place. So you have to be rigorous about it. Science is often, the, the modern term science is often um, built on the idea of, of experiments and being able to repeat the experiment but that doesn't go for historical phenomena exorcism possessions and exorcism are historical phenomena you can't subject it to control conditions or to an experiment just as you can't do the resurrection you know right. uh, there was one resurrection in history now saint paul a favorite of you and mine went to Corinth, which was a little bit like going to San Francisco or something, <laughs> and, saying, and saying, look, I, this man appeared to me, and he appeared to 500 other people. You can go talk to them. They're still alive. Amen. That's evidence, too. It's just different ev evidence than what, what some of the skeptical people say. Well, this should be subject to experimentation. Evil spirits are not allow going to allow themselves, trust me. <laughs> To be experimented upon. Yes, that's very interesting. Now, my two quick questions, and then uh, I'm going to leave you with whatever you want to discuss. Uh, when I normally interview people, when I do videos, I always use, I like to throw in some humor and some jokes. And I 
I had found a, a funny joke and I told my wife and she just looked at me in horror. She's like, this is a very serious subject. People's lives are being destroyed. This people are are suffering. You can't make a joke about it. And 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 then the more I read your book, I was like, wow, she's right. Especially reading the thing about the breeder. I was so disturbed. I'm like, yeah, you're right. Sometimes I guess I shouldn't throw in any jokes. But then when I speak to you, and even I noticed when I spoke to Father Vincent Lampart, you guys have good sense of humors and you seem like you have the joy of the Lord and you seem, you seem just like happy guys. I mean, how do you not allow everything you see? How do you not allow the devil to steal your joy? If he can't steal your joy, how do the rest of us get away with complaining? Oh, the devil's doing this to me. So what's your advice to us who let the devil steal? Well, our joy? First of all, I don't want to, I don't want to separate myself from the rest of us. Uh, <laughs> 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 We're just, we're just one more guy, but uh, no, I mean, obviously I try to uh, keep up my spiritual life. I always ask people, and, and including your audience today, I ask people to pray for me because I think I need protection. But, uh, you know, I think the mark of uh, a Christian, if I may say so, is a sense of humor. You know, St. Thomas Aquinas connects it with humility. We all should be humble. We all... We all can do foolish things in our life, and we have to we have to have a sense of humor about ourselves as well as other people. Um, so that doesn't mean that we minimize the tragedy, not only of satanic stuff, but let's face it. I mean, you talk about a war in Ukraine, you talk about abortion, you talk about starving kids all over the world. That dwarfs what we're talking about today in frequency, but. I don't I don't think that means that we have to be gloomy gusses all the time. Good. And then my second question, and then I'll let you uh, have the floor and tell us whatever you feel like telling us. You were a professional or semi-professional basketball player. In your humble opinion, who's better, LeBron James or Michael Jordan? That's a very tough one because... Uh, <laughs> It's a complicated. <laughs> I'm, I'm also, I'm also, by the way, as a New Yorker, uh, and this is going to surprise people. Uh, I'm a pretty big Kevin Durant fan. Okay, there you go. Uh, you know, he's if up you there. Say and, you know, for instance, Durant is a better shooter than Jordan. This is true. And uh, he, what what set Jordan apart, I think, was he particularly showed up in the clutch games Amen. and You're right. not, that, not that Durant didn't and LeBron, but he also pushed his teammates in a very successful way. Yeah, he, he was, was kind good. of a difficult guy and he really pushed his teammates. Now LeBron also is an amazing athlete. Uh, so uh, hey, hey, if I was starting a team, I'd take any one of those. Three, but... <laughs> all right. All right. I wanted to quote you as one of the smartest men I know said this, but I guess I'll I'll just have to say it's complicated. I I I, I can't. It's a good question. I can't. Say. <laughs> so hey, listen, uh, I really am so thankful you came on. We got to do this again. There's I have five pages of questions I didn't even get to, but we'll get to it another time. So I want to know what you're thinking about. What's what's your future? You, you wrote this great book. Do you have any other books or anything else you want to share with us? But I recommend all my viewers get Demonic Foes by Dr. Richard Gallagher. Very insightful, not only to, to demonic stuff, but just gives you an insight to spiritual. I mean, you know, resist the devil and he shall flee, the Bible says. And, you know, read this and learn how to fight the good fight. But what would you like to tell everybody? Well, you know, you asked me about discernment, which it's it's not... Um, Einsteinian difficult, but it's that's why I wrote the book. So to give people a really comprehensive uh, uh, look at a an important subject for all of us to ponder, but also a complicated subject to unravel. Uh, there are a lot of myths about it. Uh, in the future, I'm sure I, I I'm always doing some writing of one sort or another. Uh, I am a professor, so I'm expected to write. Um, what interests me, uh, although careful what you wish for, is Hollywood wants to make a movie out of the Julia story. That would be exciting. To die, if you've ever heard of Jason Blum, 
who's a yes, big uh, Hollywood. Yeah. He's a mover and shaker. So uh, when when he uh, and I talked, he said, "This is the this is the Hollywood lingo." He said, "This is the hottest intellectual property I've ever seen." He thought it was a great story. <laughs> I agree with him. And he's he's very much a a horror aficionado. So that's going on. You ask me what else I want to say. I mean, sometimes people also ask me, uh, Rob, how do you feel being out of the mainstream? I said, what mainstream are you talking about? Wow. Most people in the U.S. believe in the devil. Most people in world history and around the world today, I mean, my book was just translated into Japanese. They believe in evil spirits. So, Yes, psychiatrists tend to be a little skeptical about it because we see a lot of people who think or imagine, maybe because of uh, brain hallucinations, they think they're being attacked by an evil spirit when they're not. So a lot of psychiatrists are just um, skeptical. But listen, I don't regard myself as out of the mainstream, certainly worldwide history. Wow, that's a very good point. The, the, the other point to underscore, we kind of touched on it at the beginning, but I don't want people to think exorcism is magic. Um, when uh, Julia called the priest prayers mumbo jumbo, I think she was kind of saying, you know, he's just kind of another witch doctor. Um, they're not witch doctors. First of all, they themselves don't work the magic. They, it's our Lord who delivers people, not not the priest. Number two, it underscores the point that people don't get better from possessions, generally, just from an exorcism. They have to work at it. They have to turn to Christ. They, they certainly, well, they certainly have to turn to God. They have to, uh, because there, there are non-Christian possessions too. They have to turn to God they have to reform their life. They certainly have to renounce any kind of evil ties or occult involvement. So um, that's what Hollywood tends to get wrong. They they act like the exorcist is a magician. So I'll try. To, I'll have to convince Hollywood in my movie that they got to tell the real story. Man. Julia was never delivered. That's sad. precisely because. Shh, not because of the exorcism, she had several, but because she never renounced her evil ways, she never turned to Christ. Wow, that's sad. And uh, I said I didn't have any more questions, but people that do get delivered, I would imagine they would be so in love with Jesus over getting delivered. Am I, am I accurate to say that? I would imagine if I was delivered from a possession, I would be so thankful to the Lord. Well, I think there are exceptions. Remember, even in the gospel, Jesus says... Uh, after delivering somebody, he says, you know, pray that uh, this doesn't come back seven devils worse than the first. Yeah. So it's possible for people to relapse. Um, but you're right. Uh, most people, it kind of deepens their understanding of supernatural realities uh, by by being delivered. I, I think a huge problem in this country, and another reason why I do speak out, and I think in some ways why you would be motivated to interview someone like myself or Father Lampert is our younger generation, and, and in some ways it's the fault of our older generation, has lost sight of the supernatural. And I think you have to have, as most societies in history have had, even the pagan societies kind of had some distorted view of the supernatural. Um, you have to have a sense of the supernatural. I'm including the preternatural under that. In other words, that there are cosmic forces outside of even human behavior that exist in the universe and that we need to understand and, and try to work with. Um, I think a lot of our younger people have, in part because they haven't been exposed to it on an intelligent level sometimes, they've lost sight of that. That's another right. reason I wrote the book. I think, I think you're right. Well, I'm thankful you wrote the book, and I'm thankful you came on the show. And uh, you're welcome on whenever you whenever you want. Just give me a call. So uh, God bless. Thank you, uh, Rob. It was uh, nice to uh, uh, be invited and uh, keep up your own good work. Thank you.